so hi guys. Um, my name is Bach Hadry. I work here at LinkedIn. I am a part of the SNA team, that's Search Network and Analytics. I'm actually part of the analytics um, part of that, which is basically the, what the team does is they build um, products that are derived from uh, the massive amounts of data that LinkedIn.com collects on its users. So um, you may be familiar with some of these if you use LinkedIn. Products like people you may know, profile stats, or who viewed my profile, career explorer. These are all products that are built off of LinkedIn's data. Um, and one of the things that we really would like to do is be able to create new products and iterate rapidly. So um, LinkedIn's web application framework is currently a, a very Java-centric, Java framework, Spring MVC heavy um, code base. And we found that it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to iterate rapidly when you have to create, you know, 10 classes and edit 15 XML files and that kind of thing to get, you know, a web application up and running in an environment. And that's just, that's not just LinkedIn. That's any, I think, any site web app that uses Java to do web application development. So, um, why did we use, why do, why are we trying to use JRuby? So, um, you know, code speaks louder than words. Um, we wanted to be able to iterate rapidly. We wanted to be able to reuse a lot of our existing Java infrastructure that we have, libraries to authenticate, libraries to log, libraries to track. That was all there in Java, and we didn't want to have to um, recreate it. This is very similar to Noah to what you guys were doing um, at OnSite. Um, the JVM, which is an awesome piece of software. It has, you know, tons of monitoring. It's heavily tuned. The garbage collection is great. The garbage collection is tunable. Um, all that stuff about the JVM is really great. Um, we want to be able to hire Ruby people. Um, Ruby is a language that's used for a lot of web application development, and, and I think Ruby and web application development sort of go hand in hand. Um, and so we sort of expand our talent pool that way. And uh, we want to have fun coding. I mean, I think it's just a lot of fun coding in Ruby. So we wanted to capitalize on all of that. Um, so some background on our site. Let's bring up profile of a guy named Matt Hayes, who's my partner in crime in uh, getting a lot of this JRuby infrastructure up and running. So a consumer web app like LinkedIn, you have to authenticate to access pages. So here in this case, I'm authenticating. That's my password. Oh yeah. And I get redirected to Matt's profile page. When you look at this profile page, there's a ton of data that's actually being collected. Um, there's information about Matt. There is his reading list. There is his activity, his um, experience, his profile, his connections, um, groups, education, all this stuff. All this data is basically scattered um, around uh, LinkedIn's back end. There's databases, there's services, there's key value stores, there's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of service calls going on to aggregate this data. Um, not only that, there is this thing, I don't know if this is web parlance, I think it is, it's called a Chrome. It's basically the thing that decorates every LinkedIn page. So we have this header that has, um, you know, home profile, all this stuff that follows you everywhere you go on LinkedIn and gives you context on your LinkedIn site and the ability for you to access your information on LinkedIn. That Chrome is available everywhere. That Chrome is implemented in JSP in our Java web framework. So we wanted to be able to reuse that Chrome when we do um, web app implementation in JRuby. We also wanted to be able to get all this data. So, um, you know, site speed is really important here at LinkedIn. And when you're doing so many backend service calls, you want to try and be as fast as possible. So LinkedIn has basically created a asynchronous parallel service IO layer. Um, so when, it when the um, web app retrieves all this data, the page doesn't take, um, uh, as long to load as the sum of all of the service calls. It takes as long to load as the slowest service call that's made. So that requires sort of an asynchronous parallel kind of RPC layer. 
Um, and I'll go into more of that later as to how we implemented that in our uh, in our JRuby web application framework. So, so that's a little background on um, the kinds of things that we had to, the challenges that we had to solve when um, translating a LinkedIn web application to um, JRuby. This is like a five mile high view of the LinkedIn architecture. We've got the front end, which is basically just a bunch of individual web applications running on different machines in different Tomcat instances. Each of these web applications depends on a variety of backend services. Um, and again, these service calls are done in a you know, parallel asynchronous fashion. So um, we needed to be able to implement that. So how do we take JRuby and plug that into you know, an existing full featured custom Java web application framework that has, that's using Spring MVC and a custom JSP compiler that's deployed to Tomcat? So it's kind of a challenge to get, you know, the sort of the, the, the round peg to fit in that square hole. And I wanted to, so I wanted to show you guys like exactly uh, what our web application architecture looks like as far as JRuby is concerned. So the request comes in to our data center. It hits a uh, machine that's running Tomcat and Tomcat, you know, understands the servlet API. Um, all of our production web apps are deployed as wars on these Tomcat machines. So this, the, the request comes in to Tomcat. Um, then it hits a bunch of custom uh, LinkedIn filters and a custom LinkedIn servlet. That is, these are, uh, this, the servlet is a Spring MVC servlet. And they do very, they, this code does very important stuff, stuff like security you know, uh, verifying you are who you are, authentication, making sure that you have the appropriate cred credentials to access the data that you're looking at, uh, tracking page views to see what our users are looking at, um, and uh, bootstrapping of our service layer. So how, does, how do we make service calls? What are the classes we use? What are the objects that we need? Um, then the uh, request hits this third party open source library that we're using called SiteMesh. SiteMesh is, it's a really neat piece of software that what it does is it takes HTML and it breaks it, it turns it into, it, it turns basically an HTML string um, into uh, an object. And on that object, you can access the header, the body and the footer. And then what you can do is merge the head of that HTML content with another head. So this was the key for us to be able to get, you know, control over our Chrome. So the Chrome is what loads our JavaScript, it's what loads our CSS, it's what sets the title, it's basically the head, the HTML head of um, the page. So um, we need to be able to add JavaScript, we need to be able to add CSS, we need to be able to change the title of the page. And we used SiteMesh to do this. Um, from SiteMesh, we go into a piece of software called JRuby Rack. So if anybody's heard of Rack, it's sort of like, I'd say, an analogy to uh, Java Servlet API. It's sort of a unified Ruby web application framework. It has, it, it specifies an interface. Um, and basically that interface, like where, you know, the Java Servlet API has service, post, get, delete, you know, all that stuff that, um, uh, the HTTP servlet implements, Rack basically has an interface that's called call, which gets a request and returns a response. So what JRuby Rack does is it um, acts, it's, it's basically, it exposes a servlet API, but then it um, accepts basically a Rack uh, application, a Ruby Rack application, and can call into that Ruby Rack web application. Um, so what we did is we actually had to create a customized LinkedIn rack servlet um, because the out of the box rack servlet that comes with JRuby rack didn't exactly meet our needs. So we overwrote it so that we could do some special case um, error handling. So like what happens when our underlying code throws an exception? We want to be able to, you know, forward to a 404 page, a 500 page, back to the home page, back to the login page, depending on the use case of what the exception is. And so the JRuby, JRuby Rack has this thing called Rack Servlet. We have our own LinkedIn Rack Servlet. And the way we transfer control from, um, you know, Rack 
to from um, from our LinkedIn servlet that you know second box to JRuby Rack is via um, name dispatch. So um, the servlet API allows you to reference servlets that you declare on your web.xml and allows you to redirect to those servlets. And uh, there's some finicky stuff between whether you forward, you use a dispatcher and you forward to a servlet, or whether you use a name dispatcher. So we transfer control via a name dispatcher. This allows us to do things like redirect from our JRuby code. Um, it allows us to send uh, set response statuses in our JRuby code. So this is an important um, uh, realization that we had when uh, implementing this. Then the JRuby rack actually calls into Sinatra. So I get the feeling that this is a pretty like Rails friendly crowd. Um, how many of you guys know or have used Sinatra before? Okay, so a lot of you. But for, tho for those of you who haven't, Sinatra is a very, very lightweight Ruby web application framework. Um, I can, I'll show you a little bit of Sinatra code in a bit. Um, but we had to do some custom stuff even within Sinatra. We, um, we created a custom service DSL that allows us to make asynchronous backend calls. Um, and our backend calls are, you know, they're, they're parallel, uh, they're asynchronous, and they're based on um, Google's protobufs. They're not REST, they're not, you know, um, database calls or anything like that. And then we also created some custom Sinatra extensions that allow us to do a lot of the functionality that our regular um, Java web applications do, such as, you know, URL generation, um, which means linking to other parts of the, of the um, LinkedIn.com site, such as a profile page or an email or something like that. Logging, um, authentication, formatting resources, things like, you know, you have a geolocation. How do you represent that as a string to the user? You don't want to say, you know, this location is 94025. You want to say, like, Menlo Park, California. So we wanted to be able to do all of this within a, a JRuby web app. And here's what Sinatra looks like. So a very simple Sinatra app would be, you know, um, get uh, hello. Hello is the route, the, uh, uh, the actual request path. And um, you can use uh, ERB just like in Rails. And you pass in a template, this in this case called layout. And then you can get out what that returns is basically some HTML. And then eventually that makes its way out of our stack um, you know, it goes through site mesh. Site mesh takes the the HTML response, breaks it into an object, applies the applies the um, Chrome to it, and um, then you have a response. So uh, let's see some of this in action. So here is a LinkedIn JRuby web application. It's one, two, three, four, seven lines of code. And what this gets you is this. So you see the LinkedIn Chrome. Uh, you see the content that you generated from the Sinatra route. You see the footer, um, all those links that um, are required. One of the um, really awesome things about using Ruby, and one of the really nice things about using Sinatra, is um, dynamic class reloading. So let's say I decided that this page requires the user to authenticate. I simply add a, one of our Sinatra extensions, and I re reload the page. This now forces me to authenticate the control route. So what this, what this shows you is an example of how we manage to control um, our uh, Chrome. So we're able to um, basically set a CSS style in the header, and we're able to um, specify meta tags that actually say what kind of Chrome theme we want to apply. So our service layer DSL. So um, the authenticate call forces the user to, um, uh, to redirect back to the login page, and then we'll authenticate them and then redirect them back to um, the route that they were originally at. Um, here is how we implemented our, um, our, uh, our service layer. So what you see here um, is the declaration of um, some resources that we want to get data from. Um, there is a, uh, what 
we call a URI, sort of in the RESTful sense, and a version on that URI. And we specify that we want to get data from that um, resource. Um, in this case, we're getting uh, data from two resources. One is a uh, profile resource. The other is a member connections resource. That will return us two bits of data, profile data and connection data. So uh, the key to the actual um, parallel asynchronous part of this is this assemble block. So what this assemble block does is um, it makes those, it allows those two get calls to be done in parallel. So what we try to do here is, you know, there's this sort of like uh, difficulty when you're working with an, an asynchronous um, uh, RPC framework where the code that you see isn't necessarily the order in which it's executed because it's asynchronous. Um, we also have a, um, a pretty uh, sophisticated framework where um, uh, the, it knows about dependencies and it can resolve dependencies. So you can specify that one piece of data depends on the result of another. And then um, you basically create this big dependency tree and it will, this framework will understand which data needs to be fetched, what data can be fetched in parallel, and then in the end assembles all that data together and returns it to the user. In Java land, this is kind of difficult. When you look at the code, it's kind of difficult to understand. But because Ruby is so expressive and it allows us to create these uh, DSLs, um, we basically were able to um, create a, you know, a little simple, simple language that specifies what data we want to get and sort of shows it in an imperative way, but it's actually happening in a declarative way. Um, though when the block does, when the block returns, you can be guaranteed that you actually have this data. And then you can simply uh, refer to the data um, um, as when it's returned and uh, show the data that way. So we were able to not only use our Chrome, use our authentication, take advantage of our backend of our sort of asynchronous IO layer. We were able to do all of that in JRuby. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's going to, it's going to hopefully help us um, make our web application development faster and easier. Um, there are some, you know, there, there are some outstanding issues, like we, we want to we test the performance of this when, it, when we fully ramp up some of these um, JRuby web applications in, in production um, and, uh, and, see, and see how it all goes. But right now it looks uh, really promising. So um, here's an example. Not sure if you guys have heard of a, um, new product that we've launched. It's in beta right now. It's by invite only. It's called Signal. And what it does is it marries um, LinkedIn status updates with um, tweets from people that are in your LinkedIn network. And then it allows you to refine uh, that stream so that you can actually, you know, try and get relevant data from this like, you know, overload of information. So for example, here, um, I am looking at um, status updates and tweets from uh, people who are in my first level of connections, from uh, people who are in the staffing and recruiting industry, and who work at LinkedIn. So, um, and it's very dynamic. So I can say, no, you know what, I'm interested in seeing tweets and status updates from people in computer software, but not in staffing and recruiting. Um, so this allows me to see that. And this is all done in JRuby. Um, so that's an example of a, of a LinkedIn product in action. Thanks, guys. But <laughs> hopefully you'll be seeing some more uh, JRuby apps on productionlinkedin.com soon.